so much. Lego. Lego. I remember walking up the steps at Southern Adventist University with Mimi, and she asked me a question from her roommate, Jackie. Um, she said that Jackie had asked her the other night, she said, how long do you think your honeymoon phase with Chuck will last? And I remember thinking, oh, that's an interesting question. And she was like, well, what, do you, what do you think about that? And I said, I don't think that it will ever end. No, I just think that will always be this way. That's really what it was at the moment. You know, I was, we were, um, like in love with love. It was, it was good. Like we, it was exciting. It was new. Um, we, the concept, and so every day was like an investigation into like love and God, and really had nothing to do with us. You know, there's. There's no time really to argue because your obsession is not with each other. It's not with who you are as individuals so much as it is this new thing. And so the honeymoon phase, as Jackie kind of called it or asked, in our minds would never end. I met uh, Noemi, um, we were, yeah, literally just acquaintances. She was roommates with one of my close friends, uh, girlfriends. And um, from that moment, I had felt uh, convicted prior that the next uh, woman that I had the opportunity to be friends with, to possibly be in a relationship with, I would be intentional about being friends with that individual first um, before we got into something serious. Um, in fact, there were three things that I actually prayed for. One, um, that uh, she would find me uh, hilarious, um, as I, that's a requirement for all of my friends, actually. Um, two, that uh, I could hang with her just like I would hang with the guys, and that if she was a guy, I would still want to hang out with her. Um, and then lastly, that she would be pursuing God um, just as strongly as I was. So I met her and the funny thing is she was not, um, at the time, she was not at Venice. And just because of my biases, just being honest, just because of my biases and my prejudice and my um, judgment of, of people at that time outside of uh, the Adventist bubble that I was raised in, uh, I felt that that was kind of all already a barrier that would keep me to be just friends with her. And so friends meant that we were focusing on the things that we were doing, not on our relationship. Um, so you have to be intentional that, okay, we enjoy going to this Saturday night event, or we enjoy um, watching basketball, we enjoy talking politics, right? Um, and so throughout that year, we would do things always in groups. Um, in fact, I only took her on one date uh, for that entire year. And I took her on that date uh, actually because the fact that I may be leading her on, at least not giving her the full side of why. They understood, the people understood, God understood why I was doing what I was doing, but she did not. Um, but I was like, you know what? I do feel like I, I owe it to her to tell her what's going on. So I asked her, would you mind going out with me? I don't know, something like that. Um, I was like, is there anything special, any place you would like to go? She was like, no, you, know, you can choose. So I chose my favorite restaurant, which was uh, Red Robin. Um, so I picked her up took her to Red Robin, we talked, had a good time, laughed as we always would, and then I ended up telling her, this past year I've really been praying about, you know, our friendship every day, um, and I felt really convicted that I should be friends with you first, um, and that I should take the time to get to know you, for you to get to know me as friends, no intimate romantic feelings um, involved, um, and especially because I know that you are in a place where you're really trying to discover um, your relationship with God. And I would never want to be the one to get between you um, and God and you discovering who you are in God. Um, and so I think it's, it's best that we continue on this path as friends, if, if you would have me. Because um, I just think that that's the best thing to do um, for both of us. 
Um, she was really gracious and she was like, wow, that's, you know, that's amazing. Um, I later found out that she thought that I was gonna ask her out. So she has an amazing poker face too, uh, cause I just did not do that at all. So fast forward, um, we get to, that was around February, that was yeah, Valentine's weekend. And then we get to May um, and the end of the school year. And by this time we know that we're gonna be going to camp together, Mount Etna summer camp, but something's a little off. And I had felt this like feeling that I needed to give her space, that I needed to, I just, I couldn't explain why, but I just felt like, hmm, I needed to let it go. And um, so we were hanging out one Saturday night and she asked me a question, a question, very random question, which now I know it wasn't random, but she said, have you ever thought that we should stop talking to each other? And I was like, actually yeah this this week i felt that we should stop talking and um so we was kind of quiet and then i was like but i don't really know how to do this so i was like i'll tell you what um why don't we take a week of not talking not speaking to one another and just pray over it individually and then a week from today we'll come together and we'll discuss it we'll see what we really felt led to so we took the week and uh, I remember that was a very, very trying week. I'm praying, I'm reading the Bible, I'm talking to different people, just randomly bringing up relationship stuff. Like, oh, you know, what do you think about relationships? And I remember one person I asked and he said, he said to me, he said, bro, sometimes in, in friendships or developing relationships, there needs to be time apart so that you can identify who you are as an individual. I'll never forget he said that to me and I said, wow not what I needed to hear right now, um, but I felt more and more convicted. So even though I knew that it wasn't what I wanted to do, I felt in that moment um, that it was, it was what I, he was asking me to do. And then the last thing he gave me was a verse that has uh, kind of been the, I guess, kind of the, the walk of my life, the, the verse of my life for since that moment. It's Ecclesiastes 3.11, it says, the Lord makes everything beautiful in its time. And I remember that verse kind of giving me the fuel or the, the motivation um, that I don't know what's happening right now. I don't know why he's asking me to do this, but ultimately he's going to make this thing, this whatever it is, beautiful in its time. So that day I wrote a letter uh, long, I think it was like three and a half pages to her um, that I was going to give to her after I talked to her in person, of course, so that she could read after. Um, we had our conversation and I am like just pacing, just waiting for this text, dreading this conversation. And um, so she picks me up. Um, she, ended up she texts me and says she's ready. Um, she picks me up when we drive to Starbucks, we get a booth outside, um, we get our drinks and we sit down and then I kind of go into this long thing that I felt God had put on my heart about how I don't know why, but I feel like God is asking us to take some time apart. So fast forward, I go through the conversation, she hears me talk, and then she says, um, wow, to be honest with you, I don't know why, but I've been at peace this whole week with the idea that yes, we should take a break. It's so funny, because I would always be the one to say these long explanations, and then hers would be very short, just like, yeah, we probably should do this. I'm like, okay, well, we both prayed for a week, and <laughs> this is all you have to offer to this. Um, but yeah, so she said that, and then we laughed. We Honestly, we had a good time. She takes me home, takes me to the dorm, and that was the last time we spoke. Um, it was six weeks, six weeks of time that we did not speak at all. So the way it works for camp is you have uh, vans of people who will come pick you up. So you usually never know who's gonna be in the van with you to get picked up. And I'm like, guy, it would be clutch if she could be in the van, you know, at my, my flight. I don't know when her flight is, whatever, what have you. We, we take the flight and we get there and then we get in the van and who's sitting in the van? Only person sitting in the van is no Amy. She was a little, she, she was a little like, I think I could tell she was really, really nervous how I would respond. Um, and then we went to camp and I didn't know how to act. I don't think either one of us knew how to act. So I just tried not to, to force it too much. So we ended up not talking about it 
for like two weeks um, at camp. We finally had a conversation one night about like, okay, like, how do you feel right now? And I was like, well, um, I still, cause you know, the one person has to put themselves out there. I like, I still feel the same way that I felt um, before the break. Um, and then um, I was praying all throughout, you know, obviously during the break and then also throughout that period of time at camp because I'm like, God, like I need you to show me because even though we've had this break, I need you to tell me like, okay, now it's okay. You give me permission to make her my girlfriend. Um, we've gone through this period for a reason and I just need to know your opinion on that. Um, I'm having a conversation with her one day. We're joking, laughing, and she's like, I need to tell you something. I was like, really, I need to tell you something. I was like, ah, why do you want to talk? Let's just have fun. Let's just go, whatever, being a jerk. And I could tell she was a little bothered by it. And I was like, wait, I'm, I'm sorry. I think I realized, I'm like, I'm sorry. You know, what, what do you need to talk about? And she's like, um, she's like, I've decided to, to get baptized. And I'm like, whoa, wow. Um, you were really about to miss that, Charles. Um, so she tells me she's about to get baptized. And so she ends up getting baptized two weeks later. And I'm like, wow. God, you answered all three of my prayers. So about two weeks, two weeks after uh, I had, uh, she had been baptized, we wrapped up camp. And on August 24, I can't get this wrong, uh, 2013, uh, I asked her to be my girlfriend. And this is now where we get back to Jackie's question. Jackie had asked Memes that question maybe probably two or three weeks, maybe a month after I'd asked her out. And so we were in the honeymoon phase, but a part of that was because we had been friends, but again, the focus was on the friendship, the things that we did together, the things that we enjoyed. The focus was on the fun, the exciting new things, but the reality was we didn't really know each other that well. Get your dreams, just go ahead and your head down. Ooh, you're gonna find yourself somewhere somehow so fast forward through that year we had a great year together at southern and then the reality is that i'm graduating and then she's going to go abroad for an entire year i'm going to go to philly for grad school and so this was definitely a change um, in our relationship and we definitely prayed and talked about it a lot. But if I'm honest, my focus had definitely shifted. I was a lot more focused on my career and what, what I was gonna do next and not with God in it. That was not a good summer. I just, yeah, that was just not a good summer. We argued a lot, um, primarily because we just didn't understand each other. and We did not know um, because we were going through these different phases in our lives and our, our focus had shifted our focus had shifted and so um, now i can look back and say that yes i was consumed with myself and not necessarily taking the time to really understand her needs and um what it was to make her happy or how i could make her happy that summer which was really bad then spilled over into her going to Argentina. So now we spent this summer apart and now we're about to spend a year apart and we couldn't even get through a summer and so she gets to Argentina, I get to Penn. Grad school is crazy, right? So I'm literally consumed with work. And then she's in a foreign place, different time zone, um, internet is spotty. So I don't have much time, she doesn't have much time. So the times that we do have, um, a lot of it we spent, unfortunately, especially in that beginning part, arguing. Um, reality had set in and we, we were realizing who each other were, the scars, wounds from past relationships, not just romantic, but family, friends, um, our ideologies, and the things that we uh, held dear to one another had been clouded by our love for God and a love for the friendship. The long distance literally forced us to get to know one another in a very deep way because that's all we had was communication, right? And so we're really becoming real with one another and getting to know each other for who we are. So the focus has shifted from the things that we did together and the friendship, and it is now focused on the relationship with each other and us as individuals. 
And so at that time, I remember that I was literally, and I, I, I think back to myself and I cringe because I was trying to make her subconsciously into someone that I could love, that I was comfortable with loving. And I was uncomfortable, honestly, um, because of my own biases, my own prejudice with who I was uncovering. And I know that's very real to say, and but it's, it's the honest truth. And I, I was trying to rationalize in my mind. I had this self-righteous idea that somehow the person that I was was better. Um, and I behaved that way. So I would judge or um, I would look down upon and just because she didn't see the world the way that I see, but she wasn't raised in the world that I was raised in. Um, so that was uncomfortable for me to grasp at. And so it caused a lot of friction in our relationship. Uh, God is powerful. He could have done it a lot of different ways, but I think he intentionally set it up so that we had to get to know each other for who we are, for who he made us to be um, with no barriers. We had no choice. Otherwise, we were going to break up. Because even though this reality is sinking in of who she is, I'm still uncomfortable with it. And I'm realizing it, it's because I, I don't understand what love really is. I don't really understand what that means. And so that, <laughs> that is kind of where this last six months has come into play. So I never, this is going to sound crazy, I know, this, this whole thing I know is going to sound really crazy to a lot of people, but I've never told Noemi that I love her. Um, so I know, I know some people are going to be mad at me, but I've never told her that I love her. And um, I felt convicted of that too before I met her, never to, to say that. I didn't understand why I couldn't. Um, I didn't understand why I couldn't tell her that I love her. Um, until very, very recently. Um, so about six months ago, actually, yeah, almost exactly six months ago, I felt convicted that I should go on another break from her. <laughs> and we've been together, obviously, over three years. She's graduating in a month and a half. Um, Thanksgiving is the next week. It's just like not a good time. Um, it wasn't a good time the last time, but it's definitely not a good time now. Um, but I felt very strongly that I needed to take a break and I was praying about it. And I remember I woke up the Friday, I was going to see her for the weekend. I woke up that Friday morning and the devotion was about Abraham and Isaac. And the book is uh, My Utmost for His Highest by Oswald Chambers. And I read that devotion, mind you, this is the crazy thing, I need, you need to hear this. I've read that devotion for four years straight. I've read the same devotion every morning for four years straight, maybe five, um, since I received it in a class with Dr. Nixon. And this morning I woke up and the devotion was about giving. I was praying like, God, please make this clear. And the devotion was about Abraham and Isaac and it was specifically about the sacrifice. And it said, take thy only son and offer him as a sacrifice. That was the scripture, and it just talked about how God had asked Abraham to sacrifice the thing that he loved the most because he needed to know if he truly loved him. I was taking a flight to go see her, and she was gonna pick me up. She doesn't know anything, no idea that this is what's gonna happen. So she picks me up, and she can immediately tell that I'm a little off. Um, she's a little off as well. We ended up having a conversation that night, and I'm very vague, but I kind of, I wasn't direct like I was in the past, and I kind of say, I've been feeling this sort of way. The weekend goes on, I end up saying, not God didn't tell me to do that. Not true. Um, but I, I chalk it up, God didn't tell me to do that. Fast forward, Thursday morning, I'm still feeling uneasy, mind you, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm still feeling this uneasy feeling. I'm like, God, I can't, I cannot do this right now. And I do this break right now like this is just not the time like she literally will probably hate me forever and so so uh, I wake up that Thursday morning my same routine been up most <laughs> and the devotion is the part two to the story of Abraham and Isaac and the scripture is about 
Um, and Abraham believed and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And it talks about the fact that because Abraham believed and followed instructions, God blessed him. I'm like, wow, um, I got to do this. I got to do this. That morning, we usually had a routine where I would, I would call her, FaceTime her in the morning. So I FaceTimed her. And when I woke up, you know, we would usually have devotion or prayer. And I'm like, hey, remember I was talking to you about that break? Um, yeah, I, I, I have to do it. I, I, I don't know why. Again, going into this long thing, same thing I did before. I don't know why God asked me to do these difficult things. Why me? But I have to do this. I have to do this. <sighs> and so she was like, okay, um, I'll talk to you later. And she hung up. Thursday is Thanksgiving. I thought long and hard about texting her, but I'm like, I remember last break that I wasn't supposed to text her at all. And uh, so I didn't text her on Thanksgiving. I'm angry with God, mind you, during this whole time. So I'm not really talking to him to find out why I need to take this break. So I'm just going around just angry. Saturday night, now I'm pissed. Like I'm, I'm at a maximum level anger. I didn't tell any of my friends and even of my best friends, none of them knew at the time. I just couldn't talk about it. Um, the only person who knew at that time was my brother. I finally broke down and told him that night, that Saturday night, and he, as a good brother would, he listened, and then he just said, I think something to the effect of, yeah, you need to, to figure out what's going on so you can talk to her again. That was literally all he said. And was, his, my brother's very direct in his advice. And so I just prayed. I got down on my knees, and I just prayed. I'm like, God, why, why, why? I don't understand why, why are you? And I remember feeling like he reminded me of the first break. And he, I remember distinctly just feeling him, him say that I had you go on that first break because you all needed to make sure that you were focusing on me and what I had for your lives. And this break is because you deviated from that. And I need to bring you back to focusing on me and my will and what I want for your love and what I want for you all. And so I got back to Miami that Sunday night and I prayed, I prayed, I prayed, and I texted her, I think middle of that day, you know, okay, can we talk later tonight? So we talked, I ended up telling her everything, you know, all the things that he had told me. She was very angry, naturally, and she, it took some time for us to just get back, but she ultimately forgave me. And um, that was the first glimpse that I had of love think for the first time that I could do something that really hurt her um, and her to be able to forgive me. So during that time also I'm again God is asking me that I need to be closer to him. I need to be closer to him. I need to be closer to him. And so he was giving me he had been giving me this specific topic about do you love me? Um, it was a sermon about um, the rich young ruler in the Bible and how God was asking him, he asked him, you know, give all you have, sell all you have, and then come follow me. And the crux of the story is really, will you give up everything for me? Will you give up everything for me? And the question really that he was trying to ask him is, do you love me more than your stuff? As I'm studying this sermon and as I'm putting this together, I'm drawing different parallels. Like one of the things he says um, at the beginning of that story is uh, the guy says, you know, I, I know all the commandments. I've kept all the commandments. Oh, Jesus is like, yeah, I know you've kept the commandments, um, but you haven't really kept the commandments because the commandments are about love. You know, it says, you know, Jesus says the greatest commandment is to love your God with all your heart. And then the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. And if you read the commandments, actually, if you go to the original language, when we read the commandments, it says that thou shalt not kill or thou shalt not steal. But the actual language in the actual, in the actual um, Hebrew, there is no, um, there's no negative. There's no not, that, that, that phrase is not in that language. And so the, the, the actual translation, translation of that would be, um, you will no longer do this. Um, and so when, when Moses is given the Ten Commandments by God, God is saying, hey, 
like as a result of your relationship with me you will no longer do these things um in other words it's not so much what you do it's the fact that you love me as a result of your love for me then these things will happen i remember this thing that someone told me you know god is love first john obviously says god is love but then it also says in first corinthians 13 love is patient love is kind um, love does not envy does not boast does not seek its own um, love uh, rejoices you know love does not delight in evil but rejoices in truth and then it says love hopes all things love bears all things love believes all things endures all things love never fails right but the imperative is that god is love so i'm like how do i love god if he is love well the beauty of it is that if i love god and he is love then i will have the love that i need to give to others that's why it says love god first and then love your neighbor because if i love him and i'm falling in love with him then he says as a result of your love for me then you will no longer do these things you will become like me the one who created you so all these things are like coming together for me and i'm like whoa wow like literally this is a wow moment for me and i go back to the fact that he told me that i could not say i love you to her but he never explained why or he hadn't you know yet and again light bulb moment goes off so now i'm starting to understand god's love for me and so for the first time this is crazy i was raised a christian i was raised in the church mind you i, I went to church every day um, or every sabbath um i was the my dad was a first elder my family was always involved in the church and um, i went to southern and i was involved but it was not until six months ago six months ago in november that i can honestly say that i truly truly understood what god's love for me personally meant and that he covers all of this his love covers a multitude of sins that literally his love covers everything everything in my life everything and so when i say i love you to someone because god is love i'm literally saying that i got you or i am i am showing god's characteristics his his majesty love is patient love is kind love does not envy love does not boast endures all things, believes all things, hopes all things, bears all things. Love, substitute God, never fails. So there's a seriousness to that word. So for me to say that to someone that I don't, first of all, I can't say the word in this context, especially in this romantic context, if I don't even know what it means, right? I don't even, at the time, I didn't even understand what God's love for me meant. So if I don't understand what God's love for me meant, then I wouldn't be able to love or give that love or even say that love to someone else. And so he illustrated this perfect to me in saying that I'm calling you to love your wife, I'm calling you to love Noemi the way that I love you. And you couldn't have done that because you didn't understand how I loved you. And so now that you understand what love is, if you seek me first, then you'll be able to love her the way that I love you unconditionally. Um, and so then I'm going back to the honeymoon phase and how I didn't really know her. So I couldn't, it was, I was in love with the concept. I was in love with the things that we were doing, but it was like, in fact, we used to joke, we used to say with each other, but it's true. We say we're in like with each other. It's true. We didn't love each other. We were in like with each other. We couldn't love each other because we didn't, I personally didn't know what love was, speaking for me. And then the reality sets in, right? And I'm realizing who this person is. And the reason that I could not, the reason that I could not love her and the reason I could not accept all of the flaws and um, the insecurities and um, the things in her is because one, I had not realized that I had all those things in myself as well. I didn't realize that I was messed up, that I was broken, that I had scars and I had things that I was struggling with and that they weren't any different than hers. They weren't any worse than hers or any better than hers. They were just different. 
And so all this time I thought that God, that I was like supposed to be this savior for her. Like I'm this Prince Charming for her and I'm supposed to make her better. And when in reality, God has been teaching me a lesson on love through the amazing woman that he gave me. It's funny, in our first break, the main promise I said that is kind of the, been the basis of my life for, for these last four, four or five years is Ecclesiastes 3.11. It's a promise that I feel like he gave me personally to tell me that I'm going to give you this amazing woman. That she is for you, but just not right now. And that verse is Ecclesiastes 3.11. The Lord makes everything beautiful in its time. It's crazy to say, but think that he's finally saying that it's time.